Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for the season finale of First Fridays Connected, the online version of our First Fridays series. We hope you're all staying healthy and safe. We would like to give a big thanks to our presenting sponsors, XPRIZE, and our media and event sponsors, KCRW, Bank of America, and Spaceland Presents. Don't forget to join other First Fridays Connected programming this evening. On Zoom at 6 p.m., tune in to the discussion on the future of food moderated by Pat Morrison. Immediately after at 7 p.m. is Dino 101 with Dustin Growick and NHM's own Alyssa Bell. Finally, on the NHM YouTube channel, KCRW DJ Novena Carmel wraps up our season in our DJ lounge from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. If you've already registered, you should have received an email from NHM with the link for these programs. Or for more information, go to the First Fridays Connected page at nhm.org. Now it's with great pleasure to introduce our host for Secrets from the Vaults and our resident museum expert that will guide you through the hidden secrets and untold stories of the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. First, our host, Ali Ward, science correspondent and host of the beloved podcast, Ologies. And joining Ali this evening is Casey Bell, Assistant Curator of Terrestrial Mammals at NHM. Please welcome Ali and Casey. Hello to everyone who's here and watching. We're, um, we're just getting some, there we go, look at that. There's Casey Bell, hello, how are you? Hey, I'm good. You're here, I knew you were here all along. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're here and you're sitting in front of just dozens of dead rodents. Do you want to talk about it? Sure. I always want to talk about dead rodents. <laughs> <laughs> the picture is actually of one of our cases of Merriam's kangaroo rats, and that's huh? the second most numerous species we have in the collection. How many so, do you have? Of this species, there's about 5,500. So a lot of rats. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of rats. They're really common around here. What's really fun about these guys is they're local. Like you can you can see these in the deserts or in the dry, arid areas in the eastern part of LA. So. Really? Yeah. You know, what's funny is when you said kangaroo rats, I was thinking like kangaroo rats and they must <laughs> live somewhere else. No. We have kangaroo, why are they kangaroo rats? They hop about? Yep, exactly. They hop about, they have these really large hind feet and really powerful hind legs. And there's some great videos on YouTube actually of them jumping away from rattlesnakes. So they'll be sitting there and a rattlesnake will strike and they can actually jump away from the rattlesnake. It's pretty impressive. Dang. Well, I think that's one way to do it. That's one way to get away. <laughs> well, you're yoing. Yeah. Um, and so now let's take a step back. You are a mammologist and I happen to have your business card. You are an assistant curator of terrestrial mammals. And so when you're a mammologist, there are so many different species of mammals. Do you specify with more rodenty mammals? I personally definitely work have worked more with rodents yes that's and not i mean i've worked in a lot of places around the world but most of my like research and field work has been with rodents in western north america so Ooh. and um a lot of squirrels i like squirrels so <laughs> a lot of my stuff has been on squirrels but i'm okay i'm pretty decent with most rodents <laughs> i know for any um any ologites in the audience we have been um wanting to do a squirrels episode for some time. And so we're waiting for the pandemic to be over to talk squirrels. Yes. Yes. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about the, uh, the collection that you have at the NHM and why do you have so many and what do we not see on display? Yeah. So the collection here is one of the larger ones in the country. There's about 99,000 cataloged specimens. And so that, and it covers everything. So we do, we have things from platypuses to echidnas and then some marsupials and then grizzly bears and polar bears and whales, although those are marine, so they're not under my purview. Um, mm -hmm. The mammal collection, we cover a lot of ground and we have a lot of things that are the study skins. So that's what you can see behind me. That's called the study skin, which is a dried skin with cotton to preserve like the, the fur and the things that we might want to look at for other things. We save the bones. We have frozen tissue collections, and those are used for genetics and pathogen research. And then we also have a fluid collection. So some of our specimens are actually preserved in ethanol that saves their soft tissues as well. And those are just jars and jars of rats. Yep, yep. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some of the things you study are the parasites on them, right? That's right, yeah. So my work has been on studying the parasites on and in them. So I have done work collecting most, I've collected all sorts of parasites, but I study the sucking lice. 
So those are, they're related to the lice that humans get. You know, they, they live on, they cling to the fur, they feed on the blood. And I'm interested in how those parasites evolve relative to their hosts. Mm -hmm. And then I've also studied their endoparasites. And one of the ones I've worked on is roundworms, a type of roundworm called the pinworm. And again, it's actually related to the ones that people get. So it's kind of fun to be studying these things that it's very different. It's not like I can say much about human disease because of them, but people can relate sometimes. Like, oh yeah, I remember I had lice. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean that your job requires you to be very like literally nitpicky? Do you have to pick nits? I don't pick the nits because you can't identify the species from the nit. Oh, okay. So occasionally I have saved them because I'm like, well, maybe we can get some DNA out of them and they'll be useful. Mm -hmm. But I do use the knit combs to actually comb the specimens. Um, they're nice because the metal combs that you buy at the drugstore for human lice, the, the lice don't stick to the metal. So if you comb out a specimen, the lice tend to fall off, whereas with plastic, they can get staticky and stick to them. So. Ah, hot tip for anyone yeah. who's got to comb out any lice. That's right. Off of a kangaroo rat or another thing. Exactly. <laughs> or children. <laughs> or your children. Yeah. And so what are, um, what are some of the things that we, we maybe don't see in the collection? So, in, or rather we don't see on display. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, we have like 99,000 catalog records and, um, and most of our specimens are in the form of these study skins that you can see. And so when people go to the museum, you know, they see the beavers or the big bears or something like that on display. And we just, we don't have any of that behind the scenes because we couldn't store a big taxidermied mountain like that. Mm -hmm. There's, so we need space for 98,000 mammals. We can't store them like that. So some of the stuff we have is fur. Like we actually have big pelts. We do have mm -hmm. some big bear pelts and then some articulated skeletons. But most of the stuff is just stored in drawers and cabinets. And somebody says they want to measure some bones of a kangaroo rat, or they want to comb a chipmunk for sucking lice. And then we go and we find it in the drawers and pull it out. You know, you, you mentioned, okay, let's say that I want to measure some bones on a kangaroo rat. How do I know which one with so five, 5,500 kangaroo rats, which one is the one that is the most exemplifies, exemplifies the most a kangaroo rat? So it depends on what your question is. But if you want to say for Miriam's kangaroo rat, what, what should the measurements of its bones be? You would actually go to the type specimen. Okay. So every time the, a species is named or described, it's, um, it has to be based on one individual and that's called the holotype. So that one individual, it's the name bearer for the entire species. And every other animal that is called that species is actually measured against that one. Not practically, but like in theory, the idea is if you want to be 100% certain that you have a Merriam's kangaroo rat, you have to go find the type specimen and compare it to that one individual. Wow. And so does the NHM have these type specimens? We do. We have, um, we only, we have about 20 type specimens for mammals, and that includes both species and subspecies. And um, so that's exciting. And I have a few pictures I can show you if you yeah. want. And I also want to remind everyone who's watching, number one, this is the last First Fridays of the season, which is very, very special. Um, and I know I'm so excited to be here. And I also wanted to let people know that um, we get to have a Q&A with you, Casey. So if you want to submit a question, you can just go to the Q&A tab and submit your question. So, haha. Um, but yeah, let's see, let's see what you got. I want to see some slides. All right. So this one right here is actually a type subspecies of a deer mouse, which is the most common species we have in our collection. So the most common species in our collection is deer mouse. And there's about 7,700 of these of this species. Wow. And this is for the um, subspecies of deer mouse that's found on Anacapa Island. So oh. if anybody ever wants to say, you know, is this really a, a subspecies of mouse that's found on Anacapa Island, they would have to go back and compare it to this individual. Um, does, it, does it have like a little tiny n like nubbin on its ear? Is that? It looks like there's a little notch there. Who knows if that's like was a wound it had when it was collected or something that happened in the preparation process. And we also have the bones for it. I just don't happen to have the pictures of the bones. I think we just have the skull. Mm -hmm. But oh. most mammals, we save more bones now than we used to in early days of mammalogy. Skins and skulls, that was like all that was saved. And now we save everything. We save the tissues like I talked about and the bones and the skins and stomach contents and parasites. Like there's all sorts of new things now that we save off of specimens. And then another type specimen we have is this one. So this is the demonic tube-nosed bat. 
which it's, you can see in this picture that it's got two nostrils and it's fluid preserved. So that's why it's kind of funky looking compared to the mouse is it was actually preserved in ethanol. And then it's got this fun skull. You can see there's got these really large um, canines there. I believe mm-hmm. it's a fruit eating bat. So it actually needs, I'm not certain of that, but I think that it does because it has those big teeth for mm-hmm. eating fruit. Wow. Oh, um, what a beauty. But yeah, I think it's beautiful. The spotted wings, right? Though in those spotted wings, that's a feature of it when it's alive, not just when it's Yeah, preserved. that's not an artifact of the preservation. Yeah. That is a way better way of saying <laughs> me saying it's not just because it's preserved and then just <laughs> imitating a dead bat. Yeah, An yeah. Artifact of the preservation. This is why you're a mammologist and yeah. I'm not. <laughs> and so um like uh it has what are the tube nostrils for exactly you know i don't actually know it yeah. probably has something to do with um because you know bats echolocate and they have um, some other sensory perceptions perceptions they have mm-hmm. some other skills they use senses um in different ways so it probably has something to do with echolocating or with just finding food um is this one of your favorite specimens in the mammal collection definitely is yeah um, <laughs> It's, it's hard to have a favorite specimen when you have 99,000 to choose from, but it's a good one. 99,000 to yeah. choose from. Wow. That's right. Do you remember um, how you felt when you first saw that? Who showed that to you? Yeah, actually, so our collections manage, manager, Shannon Robeson, she actually went and found the fluid preserved specimen. I found the skull and Shannon was like, well, let's go see if we can find the fluid preserved specimen. So she went and found it and pulled it out. And I was like, oh, that's do you know, cool. um, Carolyn West wanted to know, do you know what, um, and actually Richard Hayden, um, do you know what year the, those specimens were collected, especially the um, Anacapa mouse? I do. Mouse? So um, let me just, it's also, you can see in the picture that um, the bat was collected in 1979. It was actually part of the, um, Taylor South Seas expeditions that were specifically going out to the South Seas to, and mostly focused on collecting bats. And the Anna Kappa mouse, oh, I don't have it actually handy right in front of me. It probably, it was collected, I believe, in the um, 20s or 30s when they were doing the Channel Island surveys. Oh, wow. Do you get to do um, much field work in, in uh, mammalogy? I do. I have been very fortunate. So my, for my research and my, um, field work has mostly been in Western North America, mm-hmm. but I have also gotten to do a lot of field work in Central and South America, and I've been to Mongolia twice. So, What's that like? Oh, it's amazing. Um, my favorite thing about Mongolia is that in some ways it's like Western North America. It's like arid, and then there's mountains and, de- and like snow, and then there's deserts with sand and all these things, and then there's just all sorts of these animals running around that you don't expect to see in the wild, like gerbils and hedgehogs and hamsters. And so it's so funny to go into a pet store and see the little um, the little dwarf hamsters that have like the black stripe on their back. Like mm-hmm. we caught them in Mongolia. So that's like wild. Uh, were you always kind of um, outdoors as a kid? Were you, were you catching lizards and stuff? I was, yeah. So I actually grew up in rural Idaho where we had lots and lots of opportunities to be out and about. And I spent a lot of time outside growing up. I have to admit that I did originally want to study marine animals oh. when I was a kid and then I started college and decided that terrestrial mammals were much more interesting so, and me. then uh, you did you do your PhD in New Mexico I did yep. yeah is that kind of where you got into into um, terrestrial rodents that live in more arid conditions um, actually I kind of started that when I was I did my master's degree at Idaho State and I actually did it on California ground squirrels, not the species California ground squirrels, but on the Mojave and Roundtail ground squirrels of California. Mm-hmm. So I actually spent a lot of time doing field work in the Mojave Desert for my master's work. So that was kind of where that got started. Oh my god. Um And we have also a question from Scotty Henderson wants to know about that tube nose bat. If you have any idea if the spots uh, provide camouflage or what benefit other than just looking amazing? I don't know for (laughs) sure about those. Sheer speculation would be that they probably do serve some purpose. And my guess would be that it's most likely has something to do with some kind of camouflage or potentially even distracting prey. If, if they do eat things besides fruit, like I think they eat fruit. Um, mm-hmm. But I would guess that it does have something to do with keeping them hard to see. Oh. Um, are there any myths about rodents that you wish mm-hmm. to dispel? Any flim flam? They're just, people just don't give them enough of a chance. But um, 
I, I just, I, I really do like runs. And what's fun is like, people think that like chipmunks, you know, people like chipmunks and squirrels, people feed the squirrels who don't entirely understand why sometimes because mm-hmm. they make a mess. But mm-hmm. if you want to have a lot, feed the squirrels, you know, squirrels are cute, but they're rodents, right? So that's the kind of funny thing is I think a lot of people don't remember that squirrels are also rodents. Yeah. <laughs> and there's lots of, pass. there's lots of amazing rodents out there, right? Um, like a beaver is a rodent and there's these really cool animals that live in Africa called scaly tailed squirrels and they look like flying squirrels they just they're they can be there's different species that are big and some that are small and they just have these like really they're very charismatic very very cute cool little animals and they're rodents so oh. i just think people don't fully know the, the diversity of rodents right and you know even in los angeles um you know you're based in the nhm probably a lot of people who are watching this right now are based in la can you give us a, like a quick like spill the tea on uh, on our squirrel situation here in LA? Yeah. So in in LA, there's like just if talking about the tree squirrels, so squirrels in general include lots of different things like chipmunks, but the squirrels, I think people most generally think about the tree squirrels. And the tree squirrels that you see most places in LA are fox squirrels. Mm-hmm. And fox squirrels were actually introduced to LA. They came from the east. It's the eastern fox squirrel. And they have done very well here and they've done so well that they have managed to fill up a lot of the space, a lot of the niches and that the Western gray squirrels used to inhabit. So some of it has probably just been competition. Some of it may have also just been urbanization and development has made habitat less suitable for the gray squirrels, or it's just been enough to give the fox squirrels the edge to take over. Um, But yeah, so the squirrel you most commonly see in LA is the fox squirrel. And then the other one you really commonly see, which is one I saw today actually, is the California brown squirrel. So that's the one that's got a, it's on the ground, it's kind of gray, it's got spots on it. Um, And that one's fairly common around LA as well. Um, Now, what is digging up all of the burrows that we see this time of year? The, just the mounds that you see around our body's pocket gopher, which is another one of the rodents that, I mean, I love them all, but um, I love <laughs> gophers because they're just so cute and they live underground. And in LA, I've been, it's been fun to live here and see them. They're everywhere. Sure. If you go, I go to a park, I'm like, oh my God, there's gophers here. There's gophers <laughs> here. And it's one of these days I'll get to do a research project on the gophers of LA. Cause it's like, I've also, somebody also told me they're in this like one little median strip somewhere in the city. That's like, how did they get there? Like some gopher got up and ran across like some lanes of traffic and found its way to a median. So they're pretty cool. Uh, Barbara Kwan wants to know, speaking of um, doing some research, are most of the specimens that you guys have at the NHM, are those collected in surveys or are there other sources? So there's a whole bunch of different ways we get specimens. Um, Right now, since I have started, I'm still working on my permits. And so a lot of this, all the specimens that have come in since I've been here have actually been what we call salvage, which means that somebody has collected them, found them as roadkill or something else, and then they bring them in. We get them from like rehab places. And, um, but I, we also actively collect. So if I have a question about something or I want to know what lives in an area, then I'll actively go out and trap the specimens there and then bring them back to the museum for the collection. Um, we've had some really big collections like that, um, 1979 South Seas expedition that went out and brought up like, I think it was, it's over 3000 specimens that they brought back from that. We also received a collection from the, it's called the Hoy collection. And that was Nelson D. Hoy, who was, um, he served as like a game warden and all that, but his like real job was actually a hardware store owner. And he started collecting specimens when he was 11, <laughs> dropped out of school when he was 14. And he transferred, I don't remember the numbers, he was, collections were mostly actually birds and eggs, but he also had about 2,000 mammals, and he transferred, the, his widow transferred them to the Western Foundation in LA, and then they gave the mammals to the museum. So that's another way that we got a bunch of specimens, is like somebody else's collection that got passed along, and this was just somebody's private collection that was given to the museum. It's a pretty cool collection, too. Oh my gosh, yeah, I was just reading about the Western, um, vertebrate zoological western zoological one of those yeah i was just reading it they're up in camarillo and they have like the largest collection of eggs and nests i think in in maybe the world so yeah Yeah. and so and that's where the hoy collection went so that's where the birds and nests are wow um bruce or pardon me bryce rosario wants to know if you can talk about the mistaken identity of chippendale are they chipmunks (laughs) what are they 
Thanks, Bryce. Um, <laughs> so the key feature, this is one of my favorite, like really silly, meaningless facts that I love to tell people is chipmunks <laughs> have stripes on their face. They're mm-hmm. the only squirrel in North America that has stripes on its face over its eyes. Mm-hmm. And when you see cartoons of like Chip and Dale or Alvin and the chipmunks, they don't have stripes over their eyes. Who didn't do their homework? Right? I actually, I always tell people that I think they're golden mantled ground squirrels, which is another, it's a ground squirrel that lives, it's in the mountains in California and other parts of the West. And it also has stripes on its back. It has fewer stripes on its back, but it also has stripes on its back and none on its face. So why, what do the stripes um, serve? Again, probably some form of camouflage. Mm -hmm. You know, we like to call them racing stripes. Um, but it probably is helping them camouflage. It's hard to find a moving target if you can't see the outline. Oh, got it. That makes sense. So it kind um, of breaks up the outline. Mm-hmm. Uh, Juliana Clark has a question. Are there ever specimens that need to be removed from the collections? Like 86, what reasons might there be if so? Um, I would not try it. I would try everything in my power to not have to do that. There are stories about specimens having been removed from some collections. Oh, so like if a specimen doesn't have data, it's not, we can't use it for research. And while the museum has a huge education mission and that's what most people know about it, the collections that I manage are actually mainly for research. So some of them can be used for education, but they're really for research. So if we don't have sufficient data on them to conduct research, then they might be they'd most likely be transferred to an education collection or I would set them aside to use for education and outreach rather than just tossing them. Um, I have heard stories about sometimes they're really contaminated. They used to treat specimens with arsenic when they prepped them to keep pests away. And although now I think, I don't think anybody would really get rid of them because they were treated with arsenic. We're just really careful with how we handle them. But Mm -hmm. um, that's another potential reason that they could be disposed of. Right. Um, Do you ever have to worry about like beetle infestations, other parasites? Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, pest, pest management is always a problem. The museum is an amazing building, but it's old too, right? And so we just have to be vigilant and keep our eyes out for pests. Well, that dovetails to a question I always like to ask, um, unfortunately, toward the end of our time. Um, what is the thing that is the most irksome about being a terrestrial mammologist? What, what do you hate the most? It's probably is just, I, I, I don't want to downplay it because it's a really important thing, but like the, the paperwork and doing permits, like it's super important and nobody should like randomly going out and collecting mammals without the proper permitting. Like we do need to follow the rules. There's a reason they're there, but that's definitely the thing that is the most irksome because it's a lot of work and a long process to like get permission to go do field work, but it's important, but it's yeah. definitely my least favorite part. Oh, the paperwork. Um, a few people, Carolyn Weston, Sue and Steve, uh, sold off, both wanted to know, going back to pests really quick, um, can you freeze the specimens, Carolyn wants to know, and Sue and Steve want to know, um, do you spray insecticides for pests? So we can, yeah, and we're, we're actually doing a little bit of that with some of our specimens while the museum is closed. We're actually rotating them through some freezers to, um, for pest management. That's the best way to do it is pest management. It has the, does the least damage to everything, but then we can also sp- spray the cabinets with insecticides. Um, We would try to do that when there's nothing in the cabinets, but sometimes collections will spray the cabinets with insecticides with the specimens in there. And these are the things that you would spray in your kitchen. So it shouldn't be, yeah. So you're taking advantage a little bit of a a little bit of museum downtime to do some spring cleaning. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I love that you deal with endoparasites, ectoparasites, perhaps like some <laughs> other pests, like it is a lot of um, fighting, fighting over these precious mammals, yes, pretty much. Right. Um, what about one of your favorite things about your job? Um, my favorite thing about being a researcher is just like the sheer thrill of getting to like learn things, right? I know it sounds very cheesy, but there's always a moment when you're doing a research project where you know something that nobody else knows. And I don't know, that's just thrilling to me, right? Like it could be a really silly mundane thing that nobody else really cares about, but it's really exciting to know something that nobody else knows. As far as being a curator, my favorite part is just the fact that there's all of these specimens and every time I open a cabinet, I learn something new. And that's just, it's, I open a cabinet or look at a card and it's just, there's so many new fun things to discover in the collection. That's definitely my favorite part is just learning new things with all these specimens. 
And the data that you were talking about before that's so vital, some of that is all just handwritten on those sort of like ivory cards, right? Yeah. Yeah. If we have time, I can just show you. A yeah. Yeah. We have a few minutes. Sure. Kind of a fun one, actually. So um, when we first were sent home, we started digitizing some of our old card catalog. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the people who was digitizing found this one. So this is the card catalog for a polar bear. It's a little hard to read. It says it was a caged oh. animal. It was killed by a policeman as it was killing its trainer. Oh. And so this was in 1917. And it was said it was a wild caught polar bear, supposedly from Norway. Oh, so, um, my God. yeah, this was one of those things. I'm new to the collection. So this is brand new, like news to me to learn this. It was, yeah, it was, I mean, tragic, but also just like really weird, interesting factoids that we can have about these specimens. Wow. And so yeah. is that specimen still in, in the collection? It is. There it is. So that's the polar bear that's um, out at our warehouse where we store the larger specimens. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And did anyone know that the, was everyone pretty familiar with that history or did you just come across it? I just came, we just came across, like somebody else probably knew about it before I came along, but I didn't know about it until somebody digitized that card and they're like, Hey, check this out. So it was wow. news to a lot of us. <laughs> So there's a lot of information that is, you know, written in this like beautiful penmanship on these, you know, older note cards that, um, that you still get to go through and, and learn from every day. Yep. yep. Oh, that is amazing. Thank you so much for, for showing us what is behind the scenes. And we, we all got to learn a little bit more about squirrels and kangaroo rats. Um, and I want to let everyone else know who's listening. Don't forget, after this, to, you can join other First Friday Connected programming tonight. There's more after this. This is just a little taste. So um, on Zoom, starting at 6 p.m. is the discussion on the future of food, moderated by Pat Morrison. And at 7 o'clock, there's Dino 101 with Dustin Groick. I love him. And Alyssa Bell. And and then at eight o'clock on the NHM YouTube channel, uh, KCR DJ uh, Novena Carmel will wrap up the season in the DJ lounge. So we got some going on at six, at seven, eight. So yeah, so there's a lot going on tonight. Um, and if you registered, you should have received an email from the NHM with a link. And you know, for more information, you can always go to First Friday's Connected page at the NHM.org. So um, so yeah, there's much more tonight. I'm so glad that I got to see you. I've been wanting to talk to you about squirrels anyway, so we're going to get to do that in person sometime. But, um, but yeah, thank you for sharing your collection and some of the past with us. Thank you. It was so nice to see you. you Everyone do. have, yeah, have a great Friday night. We'll see you next year. <laughs>